Our presenter is Professor Dimitriadis. He conducted his undergraduate and graduate study in philosophy at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and has taught intro to ethics <coughs> at Montana State University for 20 years. He also teaches seminars for the Honors College. He is the father of one daughter, Sophia, and the son of Father Dr. Anthony Dimitriadis, who presented earlier this semester. He is a lifetime distance runner and all over outdoor enthusiast. All right, I'm going to kick us off this, uh, this evening by reading our land acknowledgement, and then I'll let you take over. Yeah. We begin by acknowledging, with honor and respect, the indigenous nations on whose traditional territory the university now stands, and whose, relationship, whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. We also acknowledge the elders past and present, including MSU's current Council of the Elders, and humbly ask for their guidance. The Valley of the Flowers has been and remains a place of learning for Native American peoples who for millennia have passed ways of knowing, being, and doing from one generation to the next. While a land acknowledgement is not enough, it is an important social justice and decolonial practice that promotes indigenous visibility and a reminder that we are on settled indigenous land. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, man. How's everybody doing? Good. Good. Uh, it's. Um, by the way, just a footnote here, the, um, because he just said that, there's a lot of controversy in, in uh, the academy and academics regarding whether a, a social contract could possibly include indigenous peoples. This is one of the current controversies in um, academic discussions of the social contract. You know, what would that look like? So there's, a lot, there's a lot going on there, and tonight I'm simply going to touch on, I'm going to touch tips of icebergs. <laughs> and put together a bunch of tips, and hopefully you'll be inspired or excited or triggered to explore the full iceberg for any one of those tips, okay? So this is a very cursory, a, a cursory traveling through the social contract tradition and other things, all right? So I don't, we're not, this is not sort of the in-depth. <laughs> um, thank you, uh, Maeve and the Honors College for, uh, Give me the privilege of being here from five to six on a Wednesday. Um, I, this is where I want to be, and clearly this is where you want to be. Is that true? Yeah. 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 Nod your head if it's whether you can believe it or not. Nod your head. Um, and I've been. Um, this talk was inspired by a number of things, but one of which I did something similar in March. Um, by the way, can you hear me through this thing? Okay. I, I do this virtually every day in lecture, so it's, it's okay with the mask. But I did something very similar to this in March, last March, um, for Honors Presents. And as you remember in March, um, <coughs> the vaccine rollout was just beginning, right? The COVID rollout was just beginning. Um, and I personally, I was, you know, maybe foolishly rather optimistic and wow you know we're going to get the herd immunity in in months <laughs> 85 90 percent vaccinated it didn't happen i do know and here we are montana's 52 percent vaccinated i think that's the number currently you look it up um it's from certain perspectives it was a rather uh, poor performance so I, I, felt, I felt compelled to revisit some of the material from March um, to try to figure this out. What the, what's going on? Right? And look at both sides, too, for sure. Right? I don't want to see that. Or, or three sides, not only two. Um, so that's kind of the, that's the, for me, the motivation and inspiration for, for revisiting that and maybe taking a little more in-depth look at uh, what social contract means, um, and then secondly, whether you can use that idea or that phenomenon to argue for, justify, or support um, cooperative action, and in particular, in this case, vaccination during a pandemic. That's, sort of, that's the concrete action I'm looking at, right? Um, but there, as we'll see, there are other cooperative actions as well. Who's heard of a social contract? Raise your hand. You ever heard of that? Some of you have, most of you have heard of it, uh, which is a start, right? That's a good start. Um, 
we're going to explore it in a little bit of depth. Um, now, I, again, I know all you folks have been reading Steven Pinker, and I apologize. I apologize. <laughs> but, <laughs> all right, you can't escape. Um, nonetheless, I think this is this uh, quotation from uh, a book you're familiar with that we're reading right now in TNC is um, appropriate. Pinker, humans are a social species, and the well-being of every individual depends on patterns of cooperation that span a community. When a nation is conceived of as a tacit social contract, it is an essential means for advancing its members' flourishing. And here, of course, Pinker references a tacit social contract without at all exploring what that means in a very sort of surface way. But I think that the intention of the quote is important. Now, certain other quotations from certain other people recently. I took, I had the, I took the liberty of taking a quote out of a uh, letter to the editor in the Bozeman Chronicle, which for some people feel is going on right now, from Jack Kligerman. What has become of community? Are we just a random collection of selfish individuals? This individual worries about that. Second, why global disillusionment? The loss of faith in the social contract that shapes relationships between government and their people. Another use of that phrase from the New York Times uh, a couple weeks ago. And then a, a, a title in the uh, Chronicle of Higher Education a week ago. Why the academic social contract is breaking. The origin of academic freedom is a clue to its unraveling. So again, that article from the Chronicle is using this, um, this, this, this name, this description, this idea, social contract, in, in the article. And I'm, I'm doing this to point out that the, that, that the phrase social contract is thrown around quite a lot. And it's thrown around importantly. People seem to mean something by it, right? And it has some kind of gravitas, some kind of weight. But what kind of weight uh, is that? So what is this idea of a social contract anyway? Well, I'm going to take the liberty, and I don't, I don't want to be too pedantic here, but there's two sources I want to quote because they're important, historical sources. And if you take a political science course, you probably have, have uh, rehearsed these quotes. Uh, one is from Plato. And these are kind of thought of as, as, as at least two of the origins of the idea of a social contract. So 2,600 years ago, Plato, um, here's the quote from the Republic, Republic Plato's Republic. They say that to do injustice is good and to suffer injustice is evil, but that the evil is greater than the good. And so when men have both done and suffered injustice and have had, had experience of both, not being able to avoid the one and obtain the other, they think they had better agree among themselves to have neither. Hence there arises laws and mutual covenants, that is, contracts, that protect individuals from <coughs> other people's aggression, but at the same time limits the individual's aggression toward other people. Right? And then Hobbes, of course, as you know, the most famous <coughs> origin, at least in West, the Western world, of the social contract. And here's a quote from Hobbes. A man be willing when others are so too, as for peace, and defense of himself shall think it necessary to lay down this right to all things and be contented with so much liberty against other men as he would allow other men against himself. This mutual transferring of right is that which men call contract. So the origin in both in Plato and Hobbes why a contract between people to limit their freedoms to protect each other for mutual benefit. And these are two right, historical motivations that we still refer to as poss a possible motivations for a social contract. That's just a little bit of history, if you don't mind. So our question here tonight is this. Could the social contract be used successfully, that is persuasively, as a justification for vaccination 
during a pandemic? So that's my rather concrete, specific question, um, which means we have to explore if there even is such a thing as a social contract and what would it uh, imply. These days, in the current thinking or literature on the social contract, and this comes from a, a philosophy text, and I like this quote quite a lot because I think it captures exactly what we're talking about. Um, a rule or law originating in the social contract is, quote, a rule governing behavior to which rational people will consent or have consented for mutual benefit on condition that others will accept them as well. This is a very succinct formulation of what it would mean to say that this rule or law or mandate or imperative comes from a social contract. These conditions seem necessary and sufficient for that. And by the way, tonight we will uh, unpack all of this. We will take some time to figure out what does rational mean? What does consent mean? And what is, what is mutual benefit? Because those have to be clarified, right, to, to, make, to make this make sense. And that's what we'll do. Um, and by the way, this is all, I'm not just making this stuff up. Um, the social, social contract theory is a tradition, at least in Western academic philosophy for the last 50, 60 years. And I would guess, you can, you can research this, I'd guess there's over 10, 20,000 PhD dissertations on the social contract. So this, is, this, is, this stuff has been going on for quite a while. Um, be, why? Because most people think there's something really important going on here. And I would agree with that. For instance, as a microcosm, who in your TNC class created a social contract in textbooks? <coughs> Any which classes? I know that my class did. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes text and critics classes here at MSU create a social contract. What does that do? It governs your behavior in that class. For what purpose? For mutual benefit. Right. That is. Let's make our seminar as good as we can make it. That'll benefit everybody. How are we going to do that? Well, well, we'll all agree on rules that govern our behavior, that make our, that create mutual benefit, make our seminars as good as it can be, so you're getting something out of your tuition dollars, hopefully, right? At least, if not a good education at most, or both, I hope, at once, right? So, and then, rational people. Isn't it rational to want to have a good seminar experience, right? I mean, why are you here? Why don't you just go ski instead? So it's nice to have that, and it's rational to want your benefit, right, from the seminar. Education is good. So notice that in this very small microcosm of a social contract, the social contract that 15 people create, um, here's one, in a seminar, by the way, consent. What does consent here mean? It means people sign the damn thing. That's consent, right? Is there any controversy whether that's consent? No, because you signed it. There it is, right? I made a physical copy. So he, in this particular case, it's clear w both what consent means and that it happened also, because I got the evidence for it, right? Now, here's one of the, this class a year ago, my TNC class, um, this is one of the rules. Read the assigned text for that day. I'm making you all now rather nervous, right? And maybe ashamed, I don't know. Right? But that makes the seminar better, doesn't it? Because if everyone's read the text, everyone has something to talk about. You're on the same page, literally and figuratively. It makes the class better. It's for mutual benefit. That's why enough people have to do it, right? For a mutual good, in that case, common to the common good, in this particular so a rule is created by everybody agreeing to it by consent, and I got evidence for that, right? That's the mutual benefit, and we're all rational. So what I've done here is I've clarified or specified consent, mutual benefit, rational, in a context with which you are familiar to try to clarify those uh, terms. Make sense? It does make sense. So there is something to a social contract, 
And this is evidence for that. Now to get far more academic and abstract, here's a, a rather famous quote from a, a recent um, theorist that, again, the rule that comes from a social contract, this Derek Parfit in this book, everyone ought to follow the rules to whose being universally accepted, it would be rational for everyone to agree. This is to say the same thing in a little more convoluted way, right? Rationality, consent, agreement, rules, um, universal acceptance. <coughs> I just kept trying to capture that idea, right? All right, so what would it mean then to say that the social contract would require as a rule to be vaccinated during a pandemic? What, does the re what would the reasoning look like whose conclusion is it's wrong not to be vaccinated? Here is probably a very, very simplified version of that argument whose, whose conclusion is this. How do we get there? Here's the short argument. One, we have all consented to the social contract. Two, the social contract requires that each one of us cooperate for the public good, mutual benefit. Three, vaccination is cooperation. Four, it is wrong not to do what the social contract requires you to do. <coughs> After all, you consented to it, just like the TNC rule. Therefore, conclusion, it is wrong not to get vaccinated and you are required by the social contract to get vaccinated. Many people go a step further and they'll say what this conclusion means is that you're morally required to get vaccinated. That, and that's on the, on the view, which not everyone agrees with, on the view that the social contract is where morality comes from. If that's what you believe, right, then any rule derived from the social contract would count as a moral rule or law. That's a little more controversial, right? Because you might think that morality comes from somewhere else. Maybe, right? There are different views on that. But some people in the, in the social contract tradition think that morality comes from and only from the social contract, which is an audacious claim, as we'll see, because it's not clear this thing even exists. But we'll, we'll look at that. Okay, so there's the, there's the, there's the reasoning, right? Um, right? And it it's, it's captures that moment maybe where, suppose you are a, a pro-vaxxer, you know, and you, you know, someone didn't, you're talking to them, and you're thinking, God, you know, but doesn't the social contract require that you do that for the public health, and you're thinking this, maybe, right? Well, this tries to capture, right, more clearly what that thought is, what that reasoning is, if that makes sense. All right, so what I want to do is clarify first what the public good means, right? This is important, mutual benefit. Um, that's an essential part of the argument, an essential part of the idea. What is the public good? Um, I'm going to refer to it as, as the commons, partly because commons is just one word and public good is two words, so it's easier just to say commons. Um, if you're uh, anybody in economics, studies economics, uh, non excludable means something to you, does it? My. <laughs> Turns out that there's all these different definitions, technical definitions in economics um, regarding what the public good is with different, um, different nuances, different um, uh, uh, qualifications. So just to be fair here, I'm just gonna use the word commons to include what are called public goods technically in economics and common pool resources. That's also a technical economic term. So all of that falls under a commons. So I can't be too nuanced here. I can't be too um, particular. We're going to just refer to the public good as it comes. For instance, right? The Earth's climate and environment. That's a big public good. That's a big commons, isn't it? The climate. And why are we so concerned about climate change? Because we're concerned that the climate, which is our commons, will be will deteriorate to the point where it's unhealthy for everybody, right? Democracy is a type of commons, also, most people feel. Resources funded by taxes, right? And these are also uh, so-called non-excludable. Um, 
public highways, snow removal, public schools, the police force, our national uh, military to protect us against um, a common enemy, and on and on. Medicare, Medicaid, and on, right? These are all regarded as commons because they're, they're public goods. Why? Because they're mostly publicly funded, right? Taxes, public funds. So we're going to include those in there as well. Um, a commons, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to define a commons here even more specifically at top. A mutually beneficial resource whose existence depends on the actions of those who benefit from it. In other words, a commons is not, its existence is not guaranteed. It's fragile. Why is it fragile? Because its existence depends on actions of those who benefit from it. Those who consume the resource or use the service. Right? For instance, of course, right? taxation. If suddenly in Bozeman, Montana, all the property owners stopped paying their property taxes, there'd be no snow removal. Right? There'd be no public library, no police force, no public schools. Right? It's, a fragi it's fragile because it depends on enough people doing the cooperative thing. So we'll define the cooperative action in the commons as that action such that if enough people do it, the commons survives. If enough people pay their taxes, we do have those common resources that benefit everybody. Right? The defect action then, of course, would be the action <coughs> such that if enough people did that, the commons is destroyed or disappears. Uh, famously, uh, Garrett Hardin in 1968 uh, called this the tragedy of the commons. That became a stock phrase in this discussion. That just means that enough people defect and the commons is destroyed. Enough people don't, don't do the cooperative thing, right? And the commons is destroyed. Um, potlucks. This is a very small commons. Potlucks. What do you need to make a potluck successful? <laughs> enough people have to bring food. But notice, not everybody has to, right? Suppose you have a potluck with 11 people, and 10 people bring food, and the 11th person doesn't. Do you still have the potluck? Yes, yes you do. What do we call the 11th person, by the way? Free rider. Free rider, thank you. Good. You're five slides ahead of me already. Um, right. So, right, so what enough means is, is variable from commons to commons. Herd immunity, how many people do you need to get vaccinated for herd immunity, which is a commons? 80%? It depends on who you talk to, right? <laughs> on which public health scientist you talk to. 85%, 90%, 75%. But notice how that's a variable number, right? And it doesn't, it's not 100%. So you can get herd immunity, protection against the virus without everybody, without everybody in that commons getting, doing the cooperative thing. Just enough people have to. Um, that's important, right? That's, that's really important, as, as you'll see later on. Make sense? Yeah, okay. Now I'm just kind of defining terms so that we're all on the same page. Um, there are lots of types of public goods or commons. I just want to identify two, uh, contributed, contributory commons and fair share commons. And these are defined by the, action, the type of cooperative actions that are necessary to keep that commons alive. Um, what I call contributory commons are such that they survive or are maintained by enough people contributing something, doing something uh, such that that commons benefits everybody. Like, Pete's Hill, Bozeman, Montana. What action by dog owners do you have to do in order to make Pete's Hill a, a, a pleasant place for everybody? Dog owners. To walk their dogs on Peace Hill. What do they have to do? Pick up their poop. Pick up, not their poop, their dog's poop. <laughs> <laughs> they should also pick up their poop. But they should do that somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, pick, look, if enough people pick up their dog poop, their dog's poop on Pete Hill, Pete's Hill will be pleasant for everybody. What if it turns out that someday, one day no one does? Believe me, on Pete's Hill there's so many dogs. That would be disastrous. You wouldn't be able to walk on Pete's Hill if there's that <coughs> dog shit everywhere, excuse me. Right? Um, so that's a, that's a commons. It's a, it's a contributory commons. Obviously, taxes, 
All the, be the benefits for paying taxes are contributory because they depend on people paying taxes. The potluck, reading the text in T and C is one. Um, and vaccinations, right? If enough people get vaccinated, we get herd immunity, and everybody benefits from that too, right? And obviously the defect action is uh, not doing, not contributing uh, in that way, right? If enough people do that, the commons disappears. Our concern here, of course, is the commons, uh, the public good, called herd immunity, but that is, right, coupled with all the other benefits from it, of which there are many, many, many. Um, an open society economy, open schools, the public health, a return to normalcy, <coughs> a decreased burden on healthcare, the healthcare system. As you know, in the past two years, year and a half, wow, right? Um, the healthcare system has been burdened almost to the point of breaking because of the pandemic. Um, so this is a, would be a huge, huge good for everybody, right? Because it trickles down financially too to everyone. It's good. Um, so our concern here is that particular commons, which is a um, contributory commons, and vaccination is clearly the cooperative action right, for that in a pandemic. <coughs> um, I won't spend much time on this. Fair share commons are um, defined by cooper cooperative actions um, where cooperation means that you don't consume too much. You don't consume your fair share. Right? That's what's called a fair share commons. For example, classically, as you know, fishing and hunting regulations that try to limit the consumption of fish, um, fish in a river or big game like elk, game tag laws, right, are designed to make sure that the elk population is healthy enough and that not everybody takes as much elk as they want. That's overconsumption of elk. If enough people poached elk, Right, went out with a submachine gun and shot as many elk as they could, so the, some of the elk population would decrease to the point where no one could benefit. In this case, the commons is very small. It's, it's elk hunters, in addition, perhaps, to the elk themselves. Um, so that's a, that's a fair share of commons, right? Or, right, your carbon footprint. You know about carbon footprint exercise? It, what's my carbon fi footprint? Is that is that carbon footprint maintainable? If everyone did what I did and consumed that much with that big of a, a footprint, um, would that, how would our planet survive if that were the case? That's also a fair share of commons, right? Where the cooperative action is limiting, limiting your consumption of something, whatever it might be. You can go out of the back of the potluck too. If somebody goes to the potluck and they they gluttonize the potluck, and there's nothing left, then they destroyed the commons. Too much of their, too much consumption. Okay, an important <coughs> note here, right? Typically, but not always, not always, but typically, the cooperative action in, in these commons that define the commons um, entails, involves a small self-sacrifice from the, the cooperator. Not every time, for example, voting, right? When you vote, either to the voting booth or at home or by, by mail, you might feel this wonderfully pleasant surge of patriotism or collectivity or whatever it might be, right? Voting as a cooperative act is not necessarily painful. It might be very pleasurable. However, when I pay my property taxes in both, I'm giving up a big share of my hard-earned money, right? And that doesn't feel very good. That's kind of painful. That's a small self-sacrifice. If you don't like injections in the arm, and you have a shock phobia, or if you, you have fears about um, side effects, and you really don't want to get the vaccine, well, that's a small self-sacrifice, right? That cooperative action is not necessarily pleasant for you. So very often the cooperative act, which means what, right? Which means that in these cases, people are motivated to do the opposite, the defect action. It's very natural, right? to want to do that. And picking up dog shit on Pete's Hill is not pleasant, right? You got that bag, it's kind of warm and <laughs> All right, um, this is the longer, <laughs> I'm not gonna bore you with this one. This is the, so the longer argument filled out with all the little details we just gave, whose conclusion is the same, 
right? According to the social contract, it is wrong not to get vaccinated. Um, and I won't, go, I won't go through this one, but it's really important to see in this one that a rationally self-interested person will desire the benefits of the commons. That's a, a really important premise. Right? Somebody who is looking out for themselves will want right, the benefits from the, what the taxes pay for in Bozeman. They will want snow removal. They will want a public schools, especially if they have children. They will want a police force to protect themselves against aggression and on and on, right? A public library. So typically, right, per an individual, and this is a key premise in social contract arguments, right? The individual in the commons will desire the benefit that's maintained, right, by cooperation. So that's a key premise in this in this longer argument. We're not going to go through, right? Okay. But there's the conclusion. All right, that's, that's just how, very briefly, how a social contract argument would look, what it would look like, whose conclusion is <coughs> it's, you're required to get vaccinated, okay? But is it, does it work? Is it at all strong, is it weak, okay? So we're gonna now evaluate it and see where it's controversial, where it's weak and where you might poke holes in it. Say, no, 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 that doesn't quite work. All right, let's, let, let's see what that looks like. Um, by the way, I'm, I'm just now summing up the last 30 or 40 years of, of work on this, the literature about this. I'm just kind of summing up these possible criticisms. Okay. <clears throat> see what they look like. First, consent. Very controversial, right? To the claim, we have all consented to the social contract. You want to say, you got to check, really? I never did that. <laughs> did you ever do that? I didn't. So what the hell does that even mean, right? We all consented to the social contract. I consented to <coughs> pay my mortgage bank over 30 years, a thousand bucks a month, because I signed my mortgage agreement. I, I remember doing that. But I never signed a social contract with all of humanity, right? Nor did I share blood with people and say, well, I consent, let's share blood on it, you know? Best friends forever, let's do it, you know? People don't share blood anymore. The public health is dangerous. Um, right, so, so what the hell does that even mean? And who is we in the, who is this we in the we have all consented to the social contract? And notice that consent is an absolutely necessary, crucial premise in the argument. Because if you haven't consented to it, you have no obligation whatsoever to do what the contract requires, right? Just as if I don't sign my mortgage agreement with the bank, I have no obligation whatsoever to pay those filthy rich people a thousand bucks a month, right? So this is difficult. Now, <laughs> this is not a problem with the TNC social contract. Because they're the signatures, right? So I can go up to whoever and say, you did sign it, look, you consented. So read the damn text, no. Um, right, so that's not a problem. But in the social contract, it's, a, it's, it's not clear what, even, what that even means. So that's why it's a problem and question, a huge weakness. All right, now just very quickly, that in the last 50 years, 40 years or so, I'm gonna give you the, the, the reasoning, the process that social contract theorists who think about this stuff all the time, what they've arrived at to make sense of, cons make sense of consent, to try to make it work. To remedy this problem, or try to remedy this problem, um, John Rawls, uh, 1971, um, moved away from actual consent. No, it's not true that we all consented to the social contract. Obviously not true and instead identify or argue for a hypothetical or imagined consent. And here's a quote, summing that up from another author. The social contract that fixes our moral duties is not one that any of us actually consented to. It is one that we each would agree, would agree to were we all free and equal and seeking terms of mutual cooperation. 
hypothetical consent. If we were <coughs> free and equal rational beings, we would agree to those rules. And that would constitute the social contract, even though none of us actually have agreed to any rules in the social contract. Again, following Rawls, it's been argued recently that fair, that fair and unbiased consent or agreement in the social contract is possible only when each one of us agrees to the rules from behind what Rawls called a veil of ignorance. What does that mean? Where everyone has to reach the agreement without knowing any facts about themselves or their circumstances. That's from behind the veil of ignorance. And the argument is, is that this would, this would allow for a, an entirely unbiased uh, consent or agreement uh, to rules that could give, then govern our behavior. If we come in with our own knowledge of our own situation in life, who we are, our, or, our, our sexual orientation, our socioeconomic class, our ethnicity, we have all these biases and we'll be able to agree to anything. Right? Just like Washington, D.C., kind of like that. right? But without all of that, we can agree to rules that are fair. That's the idea. They have any proposals as to how? Say again? They have any proposals as to how? How? how what? There are many proposals as to how. Yeah. I suppose my question is, yeah. why is that idea even useful if the necessity is so impossible? Why is it useful if the necessity is impossible? The necessity of what? Uh, the requirement that, that you don't know anything about yourself. Yes. Or anything about yourself. Good. We're going to get that in a sec. Okay. You're anticipating the, the real problem here. Okay. <laughs> All right, good. Hereafter in this talk by consent or agreement to a rule in a social contract, I will mean agreeing to a rule as a free and equal rational being from behind the veil of ignorance. And I'm going to call a free and equal rational being a verb. Okay? So a verb, that's how I would consent, as a verb. Notice, abstracted from all the particularities that make, make, make Don Don, right? I'm just some abstracted being. And yes, we will look at the real problem with that in a second, but that's what we're going to mean by verb. So here's, I think here's your question. How, can this mental scaffolding or mental gymnastics create a genuine contractual obligation for me to do what I hypothetically consent to do in the imagined contract. It's all very scaffolded, right? In our imaginations, is it not? It is. Some think, no, it's impossible. This doesn't work, why? Because I enter the contract situation not as my concrete self, not as Don, who's you know middle-aged, heterosexual me, right? But as some abstracted rational being, some firm, it is not really me who's therefore consenting in the contract. It's some um, abstracted somebody, but not me. Why should I live by a rule set by some person who isn't at all like the real me? That's a serious criticism, right? It'd be like this. It'd be like, well, this year when you vote, or when you vote in the national election in a couple years, um, don't vote as yourself. What is some ideal rational being? <laughs> you go, what the? What are you talking about? That's not me. That's not my vote. That's a vote of some other person, right? Yeah. That's a, that's a big worry. <laughs> On the other hand, there's always other hands. Perhaps such an imagined contract, even with only imagined consent in, this, in the sense of a verb, can ensure the cooperation. And now, again, I'm going to draw from a text that you've read already in the TNC, but it's a good quote. Here's Ferrari in Sapiens. Imagined orders are not useless mirages. They are the only way large numbers of humans can cooperate effectively. Could the social contract be one of these, these very useful imagined orders, or myths, as Harari calls them? Maybe, right? So then you'd have to do address your objection back there. You'd have to sort of start talking about the usefulness of imagined orders, imagined contracts, right, by imaginary people. 
You have to have that discussion. And then I quote from a, a philosophy text by Vaughn, the social contract is hypothetical, but nevertheless binding. It is a fiction, but a very useful fiction. I think that's interesting. And then I quote from David Brooks recently, what happens to a society that lets so much of its imaginative capacity lie fallow? Perhaps you wind up in a society in which people are strangers to one another and to themselves. I think that's also um, intriguing. All right. That's one of the questions about the feasibility of the social contract. Second question. Press five above. Cooperation is rational on condition that others do the same. That is chal that's challengeable and messy. And this has been called the reciprocity of coordination problem. <clears throat> Short argument. Number one, it would not be rational to consent or make an agreement that we don't expect others to follow. Look, in T and C, you read, you read the entire Iliad. Not only the chapters we assigned you, but you read the entire damn thing. You come to class and nobody else has read it. Now, you had the joy of reading the book, yeah. But for discussion purposes, you, you can't have the discussion because no one's on the same page. Right? So if you don't expect others to do it, why should you do it? Two, often we cannot expect others to cooperate, especially in a complex society, right? Where we don't know what other people are doing, or, or, or we, there's no way to predict what other people will do. Therefore, Therefore, it's not rational to cooperate. <laughs> Who's sort of the prisoner's dilemma? All right. This is exactly why the prisoner's dilemma arises, right? You're making decisions. Is it best for me to cooperate when you don't know what other people are going to do? This has been um, rehearsed and study, studied indefinitely, what I'm going to do for you real quick, just for fun, is give you a quick YouTube rehearsal of the prisoner's dilemma. If you've never seen this before, even if you have, this is what it is. Why is the... Red have each been arrested for some minor crime. The police think they committed a more serious crime, but they don't have enough evidence to convict them. They need a confession. They take... Why are you... Oh. Actually, the police give them each a choice. Admit your partner committed the crime and you will go free. We'll pardon you for the minor crime, but your partner will have to spend three years in prison. If you stay silent and your partner lets us know that you were the one who really did it, then you're going to have to go away for three years. They know that the police don't have any evidence, and if they both stay silent, then they will only go to prison one year each for the minor crime. If they both betray each other, then they'll both go to prison for two years each. Okay, each partner can do one of two things, stay silent or betray. Staying silent would be cooperating, and betraying would be defecting. If they both stay silent, then they each spend a year in prison. If one betrays and the other stays silent, then the betrayer goes free and the silent spends three years in prison. If they both betray, then it's two years each. So what are they going to do? Well, they should cooperate. That's the best option for the group, if we add the total number of years in prison. But let's take it from Red's perspective. If she thinks Blue is going to stay silent, then she should betray so she can go free. Going free is better than spending a year in prison. If she thinks he's going to betray her, then she should definitely betray. Two years in jail is better than three and being made a fool of. Blue is in the exact same situation and will think the exact same thing. He should betray if she stays silent, and he should betray if she betrays. They should have both cooperated, but from an individual standpoint, they notice they could always gain by defecting, if they have no control over what the other person's going to do. So they'll both defect to try to better their own situation, but come away not only hurting the group, but themselves. Individually, they're worse off than if they both cooperated. This situation is pretty made up, but it has some real each other from 
magazine. Although we're still making assumptions to make this situation work too. With this model, we're assuming they only play once. The game changes when the players have a chance to build a relationship and work together to get more gains over time, or punish each other by not cooperating. Also, to make the model work, we have to make up rules for the players. Assume they're basically computer programs with predictable actions. These guys are creepier than they were in my head. They were supposed to be cute. For the Prisoner's Dilemma and other similar models, we're assuming they are rational agents. A rational agent is a hypothetical person that will always pick the option that they predict will work out best for them. They're not really thinking about the gains of someone else. Seems selfish, but it is something that real people generally do too. People always want what's best for themselves, and we don't like to be made a fool of. But if you put real people in the prisoner's dilemma, people don't always defect like the model predicts. In one study, 40 people playing prisoner's dilemma games through a computer without ever meeting or talking, only playing each opponent once, these are one-off games, using a payoff matrix that looks like this, cooperated an average of 22% of the time. These people never cooperated, these people always cooperated, these guys cooperated on half of their games and everyone else is in between. This is a lot of cooperation coming from a model that predicts no cooperation. Operation. The largest group did act like rational agents, but most people tried to cooperate at least once. It's because, well, there's more to real people. We are social creatures, and even in one-off scenarios with no guarantees or obligations and no chance to build a relationship, we're still thinking about how the group might decide. We're actually thinking from the perspective of the group and making an optimistic decision. Cooperating an average of 20% of the time might not seem very optimistic, but remember this is without Cooperating 20% of the time will not get you herd immunity. Just a note. So that's significant. Absolutely no communication or obligations. Anyways, that's not really the point. Using rational agents is still useful. The model is just trying to point out the dilemma in certain situations where people are actually hurting themselves when counterintuitively they're only thinking about themselves. And that's why we're modeling using the cold robotic psychopaths. The conclusion of the prisoner's dilemma is if a person acts for themselves in a commons, right, rationally, that's looking out for their own interests, they don't know what other people will do. That's a premise in the, in the dilemma. Then not enough people will cooperate to maintain the commons, and everybody suffers. In other words, what is rational individually is irrational collectively. This is a, a, so, a, a sobering inference or implication of a computer model, but as those folks said, the computer model does model ra self-interested rational behavior. And therefore defection, not paying your taxes, not getting vaccinated, not picking up the dog poop, seems for the individual in the real world to be the better thing to do. And the, the, model, the, the model confirms that, the computer model confirms that. This is why it is a dilemma and a problem is very, very challenging. Okay? And this is why since the dilemma in the 50s was exposed, since then people have said, well, what? we got to come up with good reasons to cooperate, such that the commons does survive. How can we do that? 1984, a famous book called The Evolution of Cooperation by Robert Axelrod argued that even when I don't know when, whether others will cooperate or not, there's that lack of being able to predict others' actions, it is better for me, more rational, to cooperate initially. Why is that? He demonstrated that at, at least game theoretically, that is, as an algorithm in the computer model, in iterated prisoner's dilemmas, that is, repeated um, situations, it is in an individual's long-term best interest to use the tit-for-tat strategy. What's tit for tat? That is, you cooperate initially, again, without knowing what anyone else will do. You cooperate initially, and then you mimic or ape um, it, the, the action of the other player each time. If they defect, you defect. If they cooperate, you co cooperate. Okay? But you have to initially, sort of blindly, cooperate. And then if you mimic the other person, in iterated situations, it turns out that um, you get cooperation <coughs> and the commons survives. That's what the computer model tells us, tit for tat strategy. 
There's a lot more to say about that. By the way, this book is a fabulous book if, you want, if you're interested in that. Some people describe the tit for tat strategy this way. Be nice first. That is, initiate cooperation, right? So be nice first, and then after that, just do whatever the other person does. And it turns out this is the most successful strategy for individuals in the commons, and for the group too. So it's both individually and collectively rational. However, that's all fine and good, right? There's a lot more to say about that. Game theoretic rationality may not translate very well into real world rationality, right? Why? Initially cooperating, tit for tat, works best for me with numerous iterations, that is many interactions over time with the same participant. That's true in game theory, but in the real world, very often no such lengthy iterations are expected or actualized, and there are multiple players. The interaction may instead be a one and done interaction in which case the tit for tat strategy doesn't work. Therefore, what's rational, namely initially cooperating in the, in the computer model, may not be rational for an individual in the real world who is looking out for their best interest. So there's a certain failure here of translation from the tit for tat computer game, right? What you, should, you should cooperate initially, that's the best thing to do for you. Maybe it may not work uh, in, the, in the real world, unfortunately. So I would suggest, just a little footnote here, that what's required for a player in both the prisoner's dilemma and in the real world uh, is, is the leap of faith to trust that other individuals will, will also cooperate. That may be what is necessary in real life to be successful and to make sure the common survives. That's just a little editorial comment. Sociobiology also champions cooperation, right, as the best strategy for the group over millennia of incremental group selection. You've heard about this in sociobiology, right? That yes, in fact, over millennia of selection, turns out cooperation is best for groups, and if it's best for groups, individuals also benefit, right? And here's E.O. Wilson. An iron rule in genetic social evolution is that groups of altruists or cooperators <coughs> are defectors. Yes, that's pretty much accepted now in sociobiology. However, again, Wilson concedes in the same passage that, quote, selfish individuals as defectors beat groups of cooperators. And this might also select for individual uh, Right? individual selection for um, self-interested or selfish traits. This implies that in a real-world context where commons are at stake, the individual will do better for themselves to defect instead of cooperate when they do know that others will cooperate. What is that? That is that, right? If I can be guaranteed that 95% of the population will get vaccinated, I know that. I don't need to for herd immunity. And I can benefit from that commons without having to make the small cell sacrifice of vaccination. And about that, here's a quote um, recently from a magazine, quote, some vaccine holdouts believe the virus is no big deal, uh, but other free riders have made a different calculation. They don't need to get vaccinated if others will, and that's, the free rider approach, right? So I've defined free riding here exactly. If I know that enough other people will cooperate to maintain the commons, I can defect without harming the commons, in which case I benefit doubly, enjoying the commons and enjoying the fruits of defection, not having to make the small self-sacrifices of cooperating, right? So if I'm the only one in Bozeman who doesn't pay their taxes, and I get away with it, right? I, I pocket that 4,000 bucks that otherwise would have gone to uh, the government. But everybody else pays their taxes. I get both, you know, snow removal and I get to pay, spend 4,000 bucks on my vacation. So free ride is very tempting, is it not? And it seems in a way rational. But what is the problem with the free rider problem? Why is it a problem? 
Because if everyone pursues a strategy, the commons would be destroyed. Because if everybody free wrote, which is defection, then the commons is destroyed and nobody benefits. That's why it's a free rider problem, right? Upshot. The upshot here is the last couple minutes. Game theory and sociobiology, both very, very um, profound disciplines, suggest that cooperating for the commons ultimately is best for the individual. However, both the prisoner's dilemma and the free rider problem reveal that at the individual level in the real world, it still may be more rational to defend. Those are the <coughs> loopholes in those theoretic justifications for cooperating. So we're left with this question, after those criticisms, right? How do we reconcile cooperation as mandated by the social contract? We've, we've already seen that argument, right? With the apparent individual rationality to the fact. And arguably, right now in the world, I think this tension is manifest, politically and otherwise, virtually everywhere. Well, we ask this. What about cooperation as mandated by legal law? What about legal mandates? What about that? For instance, right, IRS law, you got to pay your taxes or you're fine. EPA regulations, Environmental Protection Agency, about the climate. Um, fish and game rules. By the way, some countries like Australia legally mandate voting. We don't, but they do, to ensure that enough people vote to keep democracy alive. That's interesting. And, as you know what's going on right now, possible pending legal mandates for vaccinations, right? For example, Joe Biden's plan, which is very controversial, going on right now to speak. What about these? What's their status? Well, legal law, social contract theorists have argued that legal laws are one way to ensure that everyone cooperates, that is, they do what the social contract requires. They are coerced or forced to do it by the legal law. And so legal law is created in societies to ensure that people do what the social contract uh, requires them to do. It's sort of an instrument for persuasion slash coercion, right? Uh, Hardin described this as mutually agreed on coercion in that essay. Mutually agreed on coercion. Notice that finessing those terms, right? Agreement and coercion. Can the two go together? That's a good question, right? Um, and this is somewhat like, for those who know Hobbes, it's somewhat like Hobbes' central power, the Levi Leviathan, right? The central power everyone agrees to so that that power enforces, right? Requires that everybody cooperate as they agree to in the social contract. And so maybe that's the status of legal law. But this is problematic, is it not? Right now in our world, especially in this country, many people fear that legal mandates are too coercive. Violating their individual freedom, privacy, or bodily autonomy, right? And that cooperation or defection should be a free personal choice rather than imposed by the government. This is a very strong feeling in our country, some people currently. Uh, for example, just today in the Bozeman Chronicle, our Attorney General uh, used this, objecting to the... Vaccine, vaccine mandates, uh, he used this phrase, forced compliance. And he views that as, um, as, as incorrect or wrong, or forced, too much force. So if, here's, a, here's a, a possible resistance or backlash against the social contract. If it requires legal laws to do, to cooperate, that violates an even more fundamental value, namely freedom. So, how does that, is freedom in the social contract, would firms in the social contract prioritize freedom over the public good or not? That's our last remaining question. There's one interpretation of prioritizing freedom consistent with the social contract, there's another that's not consistent with it. The one that's consistent with the social contract would be this. We, that is, firms in the social contract, free and equal rational beings, 
would agree that unlimited individual freedom trumps the public good. Pun intended. And therefore, be willing to risk that the public good unravels when too many people defect. So, you, so here's the claim, that in the social contract, free and equal rational beings will say, yeah, individual choice, unlimited choice is so important that we, sh we, we do agree to risk the unraveling or the destruction of, of, of the commons. That's a possible interpretation of the social contract. Maybe that's true. Or, that interpretation, inconsistent with the social contract, firms would not choose unlimited freedom over the public good, value, valuing the latter over the former. Would not, as Volgo says, make vaccines an issue of freedom over the public health. We call Hobbes, right, originally, that be contented with so much freedom against other men as he would allow against himself. In other words, would agree to a limitation on freedom. That's what that interpretation of the social contract would say. Firms would agree to limitations on, on individual freedom. And, and prioritize <clears throat> liberty over freedom when liberty means reasoning about the proper use of freedom. Yes, that is George Will um, from conservative sensibility. But notice what Will does here. He, he distinguishes between freedom and liberty. Liberty means reasoning about the proper use or the, or the limitations of freedom. That's interesting. <laughs> so this is, this is one view of what firms would agree to in the contract, that we should limit our freedom for the sake of the public good. But I think there are generally two interpretations here. This one and that one. But it might also matter whether the firms have read Plato's Republic this section of the Republic, which I suspect some of you have seen. This is Plato writing a while back. But I think this passage is very apropos. Hey, freedom, as they tell you in a democracy, is the glory of the state. I observe that the insatiable desire of this and the neglect of other things introduces the change in democracy, which occasions a demand for tyranny. When democracy, which is thirsting for freedom, has evil cupbearers presiding over the feast, and has drunk too deeply of the strong wine of freedom, they chafe impatiently at the least touch of authority. And so tyranny naturally arises out of democracy and the most aggravated form of, ty of tyranny and slavery out of the most extreme form of liberty. As you might know, in the second half of the Republic, Plato argues that if you unleash freedom too much, then it will turn into its opposite. It's a really intriguing argument. Who knows whether historically this is true or not, but this is sort of um, maybe a, a war. <coughs> Here's my provisional conclusion from all of that. If reasoning from the social contract is to have any traction whatsoever, we must first buy into these values or these virtues. <clears throat> Imagination, trust, liberty, and enlightened self-interest, or enlightened rationality. The claim here is I think these, are, these virtues are more fundamental to cooperation that is successfully keeping the commons, maybe even in the social contract. And you can't, I don't think you can run the social contract argument without first assuming that um, these virtues um, uh, have more value. That's what I claim. Are we up to it? I don't know. Maybe. Finally, or forget the social contract altogether and just listen to Pope Francis last December. We cannot allow the virus of radical individualism to get the better of us and make us indifferent to suffering. I ask everyone to foster cooperation and not competition. Vaccines for all, especially for the most vulnerable. That's the Pope. 
It's nothing to do with social contract. Just a book. But I thought this was a beautiful book. So I'll leave us with that. <laughs>